So the next talk is about the EU Cybersecurity Act, and let us all welcome Hans. Thank you. Good morning. It's um, very heartwarming to see a full room of people willing to dip themselves into ISO norms on a Sunday morning. Um, I will promise to try and keep you awake um, with the emphasis on try. So, this is me. Um, the picture could have been taken at first and here last, uh, last day, but uh, it's not. I uh, do some amateur winemaking and thought it would be good to have a picture in which I'm not recognisable. I want to talk about cyber. I want to be very precise about what cyber is. Who knows what cyber is? Everyone, right? Or at least everyone has their own idea about what cyber is. Because we have so many cybers to choose from. It's so nice. Just like you have ISO norms, the beautiful thing is you have so many to choose from. Um, I love words that mean nothing. And cyber is just one of them. Um, the thing is, if I see the word cyber in an advert for a consultancy company or something, um, I usually start counting the density of the repetitions of the word cyber. And the more cyber is in there, the more likely is it that it's complete bullshit. So, Sorry, it's not let's skip the cyber part. But somehow people because also have embraced the concept that being the word cyber, being somewhat imprecise, being somewhat vague, that really helps because you can mean a lot of things with that. And that's the nice about laws. Uh, the nice thing about laws is that you try to encompass a concept without over-specifying it and without becoming too technological because if you create laws based on technology then the, the one thing you know for sure is that the law will be outdated the minute that it's actually being thought up. Um, and this is one of the things that I think the EU <coughs> is uh, starting to get right. Uh, I like the GDPR. I like the fact that the GDPR does not tell you what to do, it does not tell you what you may not do, it only tells you how you should um, handle your data, how you should describe it, and how you should inform your users or your, your, your clients about it, and what their rights are. Apart from that, you're completely free to do whatever it is you want to do, as long as you describe it, and as long as you, of course, remain within some ethical boundaries. But um, we are moving from a situation in which laws are very specific about what you should and should not do into a more compliance-oriented type of lawmaking, uh, which creates a framework and boundaries in which you yourself have to perform risk assessments, risk analysis, and implement appropriate and fit-for-purpose measures. Law always comes last, but it does beat technology. Who saw the debates in Australia recently where they were trying to ban end-to-end -end encrypted uh, chats? Yeah, I've, what I found most interesting is that there was this uh, minister on television and he was asked about this law, um, Sir, do you not know the laws of mathematics? And his answer was, yes, but I do not care, I have the Australian laws. <laughs> and my first reaction was a giggle and my second reaction was, well, yeah, he has a point because you can have all your laws of mathematics as much as you want. If you're in prison, then you have all the time in the world to perform mathematics. <laughs> so, law beats technology. Um, this can be good, and this can be very bad, of course. It, law itself is um, not necessarily good or bad, it's just like technology is what you do with it. The current cybersecurity approach in uh, the EU is fragmented, uh, or at least it has been in the last decades, uh, mostly because countries were not exactly in sync when developing their own uh, security or information um, management strategies. Everyone basically created their own islands and suddenly we realized that the internet might be a bit of a cross-border thing and then somehow, well, we thought let's regulate it a bit. Uh, in the Netherlands we have uh, the National Cyber Security Center and not only in the Netherlands, you have these, and they have them in Belgium and other countries as well. And they issue a continuous and very comforting stream 
of papers, um, or PDFs if you want to be very tech savvy, um, they issue best practices and guidances on what you should do and what you should not do. And until recently, um, those guidances and best practices were mostly ignored. Um, who of you has actually read one of the guidances of your national I see One, two... Wow! I must be in the right room then. <coughs> um, and the thing is, what uh, we've been doing from the... Uh, and with we, I mean also uh, some members of uh, NISA. I do provide some input for them uh, occasionally. What we've been trying to do is um, create a basic level of neutral information across several business domains. So we, I, I myself am um, part of several work groups who have to do with pharmacy and healthcare, uh, which is a very specific topic with very highly uh, sensitive information. I mean, who doesn't want to have, uh, like to have their complete patient files open for the world to see? Um, and we've been issuing guidances for some time now. And the thing is that what we've done is create let's say, some level of plausible deniability um, that from the lawmaking side of things we can say, look, we've been saying this for years. Guys, you should follow up because now we're going to create laws that actually uh, force you, or simply not necessarily force you up front, but we can penalize you afterwards if you haven't followed them. <coughs> so the cybersecurity regulation um, will be about harmonization, will be about um, information uh, sharing, uh, but it will essentially also mean informing and providing um, tangible tools. And in general, what it's meant to be doing is create transparency. Because in the cybersecurity world, we hate being transparent somehow. We use words like cyber. Yeah. And what we want to do now is uh, create schemas of or ontologies of um, well-described well packages, protection profiles, um, targets uh, of evaluation, so that the industry can see, hey, I am in this field, these are the protection profiles that apply to me, let me adopt them and let me formulate measurements on them. So that's the, the schemas that will be coming forward uh, in the next couple of years. The issue with that is that we're trying to do that from anything like an internet-connected espresso machine to a nuclear submarine. And there is a bit of a difference in complexity, although I must admit that most recent espresso machines tend to be very helpful when creating DDoS attacks. <coughs> so creating transparency. Transparency means um, mutual understanding. It means what are we looking at? And when I say this is green, do you agree with me this being green? And it ain't easy being green. So towards a risk-based security strategy. The difference that I often have to explain between the ISO 27001 and the 27002, whenever somebody asks me for a uh, 27002 certification, I'm like, well, no. You have 27,001 certification, and the 27,002 is basically a list of stuff that you can do, or you should do, <laughs> especially if you're an oil refinery in the 1990s. Actually, that's where it comes from. You can do a lot of stuff uh, which is in there. The 27,001 wants you to think about what you have, your assets, your threats, your vulnerabilities, your procedures. Um, what are your crown jewels? And in pharma and healthcare, we've been doing this for quite some time. We've had uh, a framework called GAMP, which is essentially um, a guidance on the uh, quality maintenance of a development process in pharma. And it all revolves around the world, uh, the word traceability. Describe what you're going to be building, describe how you will be building it, build it, create tests up front, validate it and make sure that you can actually trace back from the initial beginning where a feature comes from. But not only that, be very specific on how this particular feature can affect uh, the quality of life or the risk for the health 
of the patient. Uh, and that's the thing that somehow in IT we get a bit um, distracted from the physical world. I mean, we create virtual systems. So what does that do? Well, if you're in healthcare and you have like an insulin pump which is creating its own not password protected, non-encrypted Wi-Fi network without any kind of authentication, offering endpoints to increase or decrease the insulin level, well, that is very handy if you want to kill people from two rooms um, further on. So <coughs> we have been making the transition from a strictly physical world into uh, the virtual world. And the same thing is happening uh, on a law level. It's um, not easy for politicians to understand all the fine um, details and nuances of IT systems or architecture. But what they can do is they can tell you what they like and don't like. In, in essence, if people start dying, they don't like that. <laughs> so in uh, pharma and healthcare, we basically have the V model, uh, starting out with describing whatever it is you want to achieve in the end, describing uh, requirements on how you want to achieve that, create design, and in the meantime, also make sure that you are able to exactly test and validate and qualify whatever is in the end. And if you're like, well, yeah, this is like PRINCE2 or whatever methodology 2, it came from that time. But in essence, Agile Scrum is basically a lot of little waterfalls. So that, that works as well. The GDPR. I like the GDPR. And I already told you about why I like the GDPR, because it doesn't exactly tell you what to do or what not to do. It tells you how you should think about and how you should formulate measures to ensure that whatever it is you want to do does not cause unintended side effects or data breaches or whatnot. Uh, oh yeah, and then we have the, the individual's rights who can severely hinder your business operation, um, especially if you're a marketing company. It's very unhelpful for people to ask to be delisted from your emailing list, but well, those are the, their rights. We're creating a competence framework, the EU competence framework for um, Tech uh, education is also another step towards harmonization of understanding um, how to compare educational levels. Uh, if you get a grade in country A, what does that mean in country B and the other way around? So this is another nice little puzzle. And another part of the uh, Cybersecurity Act is the role of ENISA. And ENISA will get a much more proactive role in um, handling security incidents on a EU level and also a very uh, more in-depth role um, in creating information packages and also creating the schemas that I was just talking about for your favorite espresso machine. <coughs> this literally is a copy-paste from an um, education book for PHP development I recently came across. So it's like 2019. What can go wrong? Let's not wait too long for that. Whenever you feel that you can't fall asleep at night, go to the ISO website, <laughs> download the 15408, which is a, an open norm. You can download it for free. Um, and it's surprisingly readable. It has three parts. Uh, the first part is a general outline on what it does. It's a, it's a norm on how to formulate evaluation criteria so that you can actually ascertain if your system is compliant to whatever it is you want it to be, and also how you should formulate the requirements up front. So the first part is an introduction on how uh, auditing and evaluation generally works, plan, do, check, act, and whatnot. The second part goes into the functional components of an application, and I think that's done a really reasonable job uh, in creating different modules and packages in identifying the different parts of an application, like authorizations, um, user data management, and whatnot. And the third part actually is basically second part, but then the other way around. If you know the V model, start by creating requirements and then start by creating tests to validate the requirements. Part three maps into there. <coughs> um, this will be a voluntary scheme, but, but whenever lawmakers start talking about voluntary, 
there's usually something fishy going on. Um, because what they mean by voluntary is that if you don't do it like this, you will have to explain how you do it then. And in general, that will cost you a lot more effort than just basically following this. So whenever you read should, mentally replace it by must. That's what I do at least. There's a couple of concepts that you should be aware of. The target of evaluation, that can be uh, a system, that can be a combination of systems. It's, it's basically um, what, you should, what you call an information domain. So if I have like uh, HR systems and finance systems to help uh, in uh, registering employee information and to help pay them uh, their salaries, the combination of those systems is the information domain uh, HR. So do not look at systems and components alone. Look at functional application domains uh, in which you um, use certain software and certain uh, information, especially which entities are being used in what system and how is their workflow. So TOEs can be basically anything. You, it depends on what you want to target. So you can um, perform an ISO 15408 like Red Hat and SUSE did on an operating system. Well, awesome. Then you can test if the authorization uh, profiles and access control lists actually do what they are supposed to do. But an operating system by itself is not very useful. You have blinking lights, and if you have an espresso machine with an operating system, you will have espresso, hopefully. <coughs> but you want to use it in an application. You want to be able to create a cappuccino from it. So you need software. Um, and then, if you use a certified platform like Red Hat SUSE and different distros also uh, apply. Uh, once you install applications on top of that, especially if you uh, develop them yourselves, that becomes your target of evaluation. And therefore, you have to describe what it is you will want to be testing. <coughs> and you can register that in, in multiple ways. There's not a fixed way on how to describe a TOE or anything. It can be uh, an inventory, it can be a, a box of CD-ROMs, if we even use them anymore. Um, if you see examples like floppies and CD-ROMs in norms, you have any indication of how old they are. The target audience is basically everyone, consumers, developers, uh, but especially evaluators. So if you have a quality assurance or quality control within your organization, you should be reading up on this. And it will help you to create uh, security requirements. And <clears throat> what I personally find a bit dangerous is that we are looking at security as it being not directly the same as the application. For me, a secure application, it is the application implemented in the correct way. Security is not something outside of the application. <coughs> it integrates with it. So if you create security requirements <coughs> in your um, architecture definitions, include all the requirements in a single source of truth. Do not create separate security packages or separate information packages. Combine them. Create protection profiles. Uh, a protection profile can be firewalls. How do we... Uh, how do we formulate what a firewall should do, or how do we formulate what an espresso machine should do? And then a security target is the actual instance of uh, the target of evaluation. So you have the protection profile espresso machines, and then you have the instance Nespresso. So I'm going to skip this a little bit. Defining your assets, defining your crown jewels is a very important part also of the ISO 27001. Um, assets can be anything. Um, people, systems, information, box, paper, but also your public image. It can also be an asset. If you're an organization, um, you have a lot to lose when you come under scrutiny for not complying to cybersecurity legislation and having data breaches. So also, when you are formulating assets, think about immaterial assets, because they are at least, at least as important and also at least as vulnerable. Define in which the 
uh, what the environments are in which your assets reside and also what the interactions are with the assets because an asset by itself is harmless. It only becomes interesting once it has interactions with other assets and those interactions are the points in which uh, an asset can become vulnerable. In the Isonom we have all kinds of interesting places with arrows and dots, including this one. But the most important thing is to demonstrate fitness for purpose. <coughs> and what we do nowadays in security testing um, tends to go from the outside in. Uh, we do pen testing, we do uh, or fuzzy testing, we, do, uh, we try to overload systems with information and then see what they do. Uh, and that's all cool. But the problem with especially pen testing is that it's usually a black box approach. The only thing you know is that the tests you did at that point in time did or did not result in a hack. But you have no idea about the actual state of the system under it. The system under it can be as vulnerable as fuck. Sorry. <coughs> For just one little thing that you forgot to test at that point in time. So <coughs> the whole point of the 15408 is to do the other way around, to look from the inside out. What should this system do? And per interaction, how do we protect these interactions? How do we know what data goes in and out of an interaction? How do we test if that still uh, is valid? So and then apply measurements which are sufficient and correct for the circumstances in which the system is being um, deployed. So, functional components, the target of evaluation, I'm repeating these terms because you will be hearing them quite a lot and now you will already have heard them a couple of times so it will become easier over time. You, must, uh, you should create security function policies per component uh, and those are uh, the scope of control in which you decide where the measures you implement start and finish. I mean, you can, if you have a component, you can go all out like creating measures to defend the building in which the server uh, resides, on which your application runs, but that's not the point of this law. The point is that you create measures that actually have a relation to the component more or less directly. You don't need to go uh, across multiple hops defining measures for multiple components within one policy. You should create different policies for different components and you should evaluate if they match together and how well they integrate. Oh, I will be publishing my slides, so, so don't worry. Um, you can now sleep on. The part two defines a number of functional areas in which you should create the, uh, the requirement packages and just read up on them. It's, uh, it's quite a comprehensive list uh, and what's especially useful about this, I started ranting about the word cyber and the vagueness of the word cyber. This actually creates a common vocabulary on what we mean, or at least what the ISO committee thinks we mean with certain terms and you can agree or disagree uh, with how certain terms are formulated, but at least we now speak the same language, or we disagree that we speak the same language, but still. And then we have part three. So for every uh, functional chapter that you define measures on or requirements on, you have then the evaluation criteria for the measures that you've taken. Um, and we call those composed assurance packages, which are matched requirements and evaluation criteria. So that's the traceability thing. <laughs> Apparently I'm out of time. <laughs> or my laptop has decided not to go. This was the best part. I have oh, fairly... <laughs> <coughs> I'm out of time anyway. So um, I hope I've brought across a bit of the uh, idea of what traceability means, how you should formulate components and packages. Um, and I can go on for hours, so if anyone has a, don't worry, I won't do it. Um, if anyone has a question for now, then speak now or forever hold your silence. We have time for one question. He was very enthusiastic. Uh, hello, thank you for the presentation. My question is very simple. Uh, what you've just explained exists for a very long time now. It's good that the EU has decided to somehow start to enforce it.